Hi, I'm Richard Church, and this is the Securing the Blessings of Liberty Constitution class. Uh, I'm a pastor of a local church. I was also a delegate to the Continental Congress 2009, and I'm the 6th uh, District Coordinator for Wisconsin Campaign for Liberty. And this course was designed really to give kind of an overview of the United States Constitution. We begin with the history of the Declaration of Independence and the uh, Constitutional Convention, and then go, th go through the text of the Constitution, the contract between us and our government that requires them to protect our rights. And uh, this is the, the introduction where we look at a lot of the principles that the Founding Fathers um, used to shape their thinking about what the proper role of government was, what a, a good government was, and, and what government should and should not do. And we look at the effect of the Protestant Reformation and John Calvin on the formation of the United States. We look at the principles that went into the Declaration of Independence and, and how those same principles uh, that are laid out in the Declaration and put into practice in the Constitution really are the abiding principles of government. They're the principles that we ought to hold our government accountable to today. We ought to always view these founding documents as a contract. And we have our part in the contract, and the government has their part in the contract, and we need to hold them accountable to what, what they've agreed to do, what they've agreed to do in securing our rights. And uh, so as you, as you um, watch these videos and, and uh, go through this class, pay close attention. Pay close attention to the ways that our government is violating our rights so that we can hold them accountable to the contract that we have with them. So this is the first class in Securing the Blessings of Liberty, an examination of the United States Constitution. And in this class, we aren't, we aren't going to get to the text of the Constitution itself yet, but we're going to look at some of the, the ideas and the history that led up to the, the writing of the U.S. Constitution. And, and in order to understand a document, you have to understand the foundation on which it's based. And so we're going to, um, in, in this first session, we're going to uh, especially look at the things leading up to the Declaration of Independence. And you know, really, the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are, are designed to go together. I mean, they're two separate documents. They're, they're separated by uh, a period of years between their writing. But really, the principles of the Constitution are based in the principles of the Declaration. And the, understand that the Constitution really is not much of an ideological document. It doesn't lay out a lot of principles and theory for you. It's a very practical document. The Constitution, when we, when we get to the text, of the Constitution itself. It's about how the government powers are to be divided. It's about who's to have what power and those kinds of things. The principles of the Constitution are really laid out in the Declaration of Independence. But we can't start with the Declaration of Independence. We have to go back even further and we have to look at the, the historical things that were going on that led up to the Declaration. And we really have to go a couple hundred years before the writing of the Declaration of Independence to the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation, there's, there's uh, Martin Luther credited as being the initiator of the Protestant Reformation. He is nailing his 95 criticisms of the, of the uh, Pope and the Catholic Church there on the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. That sparked really not, not just a, uh, a religious change or, or revolution or reformation in Europe, but also political change. Because the, the Roman church had had such a stranglehold on the politics of Europe, and with the Protestant Reformation, a lot of those things changed. But really, the, the largest change, I mean, just more so than changing the political structures of Europe, there were some ideological changes that came out of the Protestant Reformation that eventually found their way into American law and, and uh, American independence and, and constitutional law. And the, um, one of the reformers, in fact, the reformer that you could say had the most influence here in the United States was a man named John Calvin. Now, whether you agree with what Calvin taught or disagree with what Calvin taught, it can be estimated that about two-thirds of the American colonists had been instructed in Calvinist 
theology. And a, a lot of times when you hear the term Calvinism, if, you know, for those that are familiar with that term, uh, Calvinism, if people think of some of the, the doctrines that Calvin taught, such as election and predestination and, and these kinds of things. But Calvin taught a lot more than that. In fact, a, a lot of what is taught as Calvinism um, really developed after Calvin was dead. Uh, so, some of what is taught as Calvinism today wasn't even taught by John Calvin. But there are many historians that recognize the influence that John Calvin had on the founding of the United States. Uh, one of the most authoritative histories of the Protestant Reformation is the uh, uh, history of the Reformation in Europe by Daubene. And Daubene says that Calvin was the founder of the greatest of republics. Now when he says that, he's not talking about Geneva. If you know about Calvin, you know that, that uh, he was there at the city of Geneva and put a lot of his principles into practice there. Daubene is not talking about Geneva. He says the pilgrims who left their country in the reign of James I and landing on the barren soil of New England founded populous and mighty colonies were his sons, his direct legitimate sons, and that American nation which we have seen growing so rapidly boasts as its father the humble reformer on the shore of Lake Leman. And so Daubene, one of the most respected historians of the Reformation, he credits John Calvin as the founder of the American Republic. Now there's several important things that John Calvin taught that influenced American law. For one thing, Calvin taught the depravity of man. He, he taught that man was utterly sinful and never to be trusted. Now, if you have man that is utterly depraved, that means you need some limits on man, and especially you need limits in accordance with the power that man has. If you're going to put men in positions of government, understanding that they are depraved men, you need limits on them. And uh, John Calvin put an emphasis on biblical law, that human law had to be in accordance with biblical law. That in itself was, was the idea of limited government. That government didn't just have authority to do whatever they wanted to do, that government was accountable to higher powers for how they used the power that was delegated to them. And so this idea of limited government was very much a part of what John Calvin taught with regard to human government and, and how it ought to be run, that there were limits on government power. Now this was a, a break from much of the, the ideas that had previously reigned supreme in Europe. Um, in, in fact, uh, John Calvin was very influential with the uh, production of, of the notes of the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible was really the, the very first study Bible that was ever published and it had all kinds of notes in it and many notes about government. His, his notes in the Geneva Bible or, or the notes that he influenced uh, so angered James I in England. The Geneva Bible had become very influential even in, in England and James I wanted a new Bible published that wouldn't have those notes, especially the notes that talk about how bad monarchy is and, and those kinds of things. And that's where the King James Bible came from. All right. So the Geneva Bible, by the way, was the Bible that the pilgrims would have brought here to, to America and again influenced by John Calvin. Um, the, when, you, when you want to look at the effects that Protestantism had on American law and government, there was an important study that was done called the Lutz Heinemann study. And what the study wanted to do was they wanted to see what were the sources that were quoted in the political writings of the founding era from 1760 to 1805. So 16 years before independence, 1760, uh, up through the, the uh, early 1800s. Who was quoted in the political writings? It, you know, if you want to know who has influenced certain writers, you look at who do they quote? What, what sources do they quote from? Who, who do they put in their footnotes? Who do they put in their bibliographies? And so this was a, a study of these political writings. Now these are political writings. These are not the, um, 
you know, these aren't these aren't religious writings. These aren't other you know other sources, fiction, and that kind of thing. These are the political writings. These are the the, the newspaper articles. These kinds of things. They wanted to see who did they quote from. Now, the uh, by by a large margin, the most quoted source in the political writings of that era was the Bible. Okay, so that shows you the influence that the Bible had on that that generation of people. Uh, some people like to like to downplay that and and that, but if that's what they're qu quoting in their political writings, now today you would very rarely ever see the Bible quoted in any political writings, but. By far, the Bible was the most quoted source in the political writings of that era. Now, the three, we're going to talk about the three men, however, that were the most quoted in the political writings. And number one was Montesquieu, Baron Montesquieu. Uh, number two was Sir William Blackstone, and number three was John Locke. Now, um, these, these men each made important contributions to the political thought of the time. Now that's not to take away from some of the other men, certainly Hume had a great influence and, and others as well that aren't there in that top seven, but Montesquieu, Blackstone, and Locke were the most quoted sources in the political writings of that era. Uh, first of all, Baron Montesquieu. Charles Louis de Secondat, Baron de Montesquieu, he, his work that he wrote that had an influence on American law was called The Spirit of Laws. And it was Montesquieu that Montesquieu distinguished four different forms of government. And along with each one, he said that there was a, a principle upon which that form of government worked. With monarchy, he said that the, the, the guiding principle for a monarchy was honor. Monarchy works well when you have honorable people in those positions of power. Uh, aristocracy, he said the guiding principle was moderation. A republic, the guiding principle was virtue. And despotism, the guiding, the guiding principle was fear. And that's how despots rule, is by fear. That's the only way they're able to hold on to their power. And so he distinguished those different forms of government. It was also Montesquieu that's credited, credited with dividing up the powers of government into three branches. Now, many of the governments in, in Montesquieu's day were not separated this way by law, okay? But he recognized there were three branches of government, legislative, which makes the laws, executive, which enforces the laws and executes the laws, and the judicial branch, which is to apply the law in a specific case, all right? And that was Montesquieu that divided things up in that way. Now, one of the things that Montesquieu taught, and you're going to see this in all of these three most influential men, is he said that man's laws must conform to God's laws. And so, there again, that same idea of, of uh, John Calvin, here you have with Baron de Montesquieu. Baron de Montesquieu, by the way, was a Roman Catholic. Uh, Montesquieu was, was not a Protestant. He was not a, a Calvinist, um, but he was a Roman Catholic. And... Uh, Montesquieu recognized, however, he said that the Catholic religion is most agreeable to a monarchy and the Protestant to a republic. And if you look at the, the governments of Europe, you see where the Roman Catholic religion held sway. Uh, you generally wound up with some form of a, a monarchy. The Catholic Church liked that because if they could control the king, they could control that country. But here Montesquieu, even a Catholic, recognizes that the Protestant faith the, the faith of the reformers was more likely to result in a republic than a monarchy. And so as you, as you saw those monarchies in Europe either, either uh, being done away with altogether or at least being greatly weakened, that was the effect of Protestantism. Uh, next we come to Sir William Blackstone. And Blackstone wrote the commentaries on the laws of England. The, the commentaries on the laws of England, when people talk about common law, and they're going to quote things about common law and what common law rights are and, and that kind of thing, most likely they're quoting from Sir William Blackstone. And what Blackstone did, you know, England does a lot of things by tradition. 
You know, even today when people talk about the British Constitution, there is no written British Constitution. There's no written Constitution. It's a, it's a, a tradition, a long-standing tradition, but they don't have a written Constitution. What Blackstone did was he took a lot of the things that were recognized principles in British common law and he systematized them and wrote them down. Now, it's said that Blackstone's commentaries sold more copies here in America than they did in England. You know, in England, where people knew what the tradition was, they didn't necessarily need to purchase a book that told them what the common law was. They, they knew it, by and large. But in America, where we didn't have those long-standing traditions, people looked to Blackstone's commentaries as the authority on the law for, for many, many years, not just in the founding era. Uh, it, it would have been from Blackstone's commentaries that Abraham Lincoln would have studied law, uh, even in the, in the uh, later 1800s. And so Blackstone's commentaries were very influential on American law. American lawyers, if you wanted to become a lawyer in, you know, in the early days in this country, you didn't go to law school. You got a copy of Blackstone's commentaries and you studied that. And, and that's how you became a lawyer. Now, there are three major points that Blackstone contributed in his commentaries. Uh, here, here is one, again, having to do with the law of nature. Blackstone said this will of his maker, speaking of God, is called the law of nature. When he created man and endued him with free will, he laid down certain immutable laws of human nature, whereby that free will is in some degree regulated and restrained, and gave him also the faculty of reason to discover the purport of those laws. This law of nature is, of course, superior in obligation to any other. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this, and such of them as are valid derive all their force and all their authority, immediately or immediately, from this original. Now, again, here's this idea that human law has to conform to a higher standard. By the way, notice that when Blackstone talks about the law of nature, he talks about the law of nature in a very different way than what the ancient Greeks or Romans would have understood the law of nature. In, in the ancient writers, when they talked about the law of nature, they believed that the law of nature was what you could understand simply by observing the natural world, right? So if in the natural world you see uh, creatures that, that defend their, their uh, progeny or defend even, you know, lions defending their pride or, or whatever, that you can derive from that a law of nature that there is a right of self-defense. And, and that's how the ancients viewed the law of nature. I want you to notice, though, that these men that came out of the Protestant Reformation had a very different understanding of what the law of nature was. They saw the law of nature not as something that you just understood from looking at the natural world, but that rather the law of nature was the same as the will of God, you see? And, and so they really saw very little difference between the law of nature and the word of God itself, okay? Again, you see the idea of limited government. He says that if, if human laws, if they are contrary to the law of nature, he says they're not of any validity whatsoever, okay? Important point about about laws and the legal understanding of that era. Uh, so he said that human law must conform to natural law. Again, governments don't have the, the right or the, the proper authority to make any laws they want. They have to, human laws have to conform to natural law. Um, Blackstone also contributed to a better understanding of what the role of the judiciary was that judicial branch that, that Montesquieu separated out as a separate branch of government, Blackstone clarified that the role of the judiciary is to apply the law, not make the law. Now, this is something we've seen largely abandoned in our day, uh, you know, especially, especially uh, in, in recent years. Uh, it's something that's always gone on to some degree. That's why Blackstone had to clarify it. Right? Because, because judges tend to forget their place and they start to think that it's their job to make the law. And so we've seen in recent years, for instance, we've seen state supreme courts dictating to the legislature that they must pass certain laws. That would be completely outside of what Blackstone's understanding of the role of the judiciary was. Um, 
the third point is, again, that, that he systematized the common law. And from that, that systematic idea of law, we here in the United States, we do very little by tradition. We're not like Britain, where everything is all done by tradition and nothing's written down. Here, it, it's got to be written down. And some of that we could trace back to the influence of Sir William Blackstone. Now, the, the third most influential writer on those political writings of the uh, founding era was John Locke. And John Locke, uh, uh, especially his writings that would have affected American government, were his essay concerning human understanding. And he wrote two essays or treatises that were titled On Civil Government. Now that can make it a little bit complicated. These things really were not written so much as books or, or something like that, but they were written more like a, a letter or a pamphlet. And he wrote two separate ones called On Civil Government. So sometimes people will refer to Locke's first treatise on civil government and his second treatise on civil government. Uh, John Locke was from a Puritan family. He was a moderate Calvinist. There again is that influence of, of John Calvin. And, and let me say, by the way, that I am not a Calvinist. Uh, I, you know, you don't have to be a Calvinist to recognize the influence that John Calvin had on these, on these men. Uh, John Locke, by the way, was considered in some of his teaching to be very unorthodox. Um, he, he taught some things that uh, to, uh, to a religious mindset would be considered even heresy, uh, but, but he was a moderate Calvinist. Uh, John Locke, his two major contributions is that John Locke spoke a lot more about the idea of not just natural law, but also natural rights that the individual, by being created in the image of God, God had endowed to the individual rights, natural rights. And so there was that idea. And then the social compact. The social compact was the idea that government enters into a contract with the people to not to rule and regulate them, but to protect the people's rights. That that is the role of government. So that there is, whether it be a written contract like the United States Constitution or an unwritten contract like the British Constitution, that there is a social compact between government and the people, and the government's part of that is to protect the rights of the people, to protect uh, people from being murdered, protect people from having their property stolen, the, these kinds of things. Again, not, to, not so much to rule people and to order every area of their lives, but to protect people's liberty and protect their natural rights. John Locke said that human laws have also their higher rules to be measured by which rules are two, the law of God and the law of nature so that laws human must be made according to the general laws of nature and without contradiction to any positive law of scripture, otherwise they are ill made, right? Uh, any human law that's of any validity, if, if you try and pass a law that's contrary to nature, it's not gonna be of any validity. Uh, it reminds me of uh, uh, several years ago when a Southern congressman introduced a bill to change the mathematical value of pi to three. So it would be easier for math students to figure the, the areas and circumferences of circles, right? Now, luckily that law didn't pass, but had the law passed, it, it really wouldn't have changed anything because there's higher mathematical laws, right? And often what Congress does, they, they pass laws without, you know, without any, any uh, consideration of reality. And uh, luckily, again, that was a law that, that didn't pass. But you can see how, had that law passed, it wouldn't have been of any validity, right? I mean, it, it wouldn't have been valid at all. And likewise, he's saying that, that uh, you know, Locke taught that human law had to be within the law of nature and the law of God. And so you see, all three of those most influential men, whose writings were most quoted in that founding era, had that view that government had to be limited, and at least part of what limited it was the law of nature and the law of God. John Locke, um, this idea of the social compact, what John Locke said was that in, in man's natural state, his rights are insecure, right? If we're, in a, if we're in a complete state of nature, I still have a right to property. But my property is very insecure because 
I'm probably not the strongest person around and somebody else can come and take my property, right? Somebody else who's stronger than I, or maybe my neighbors can, can join together and say, we want his property and they can just come and take it and there's not much I can do about it. Uh, your natural rights, you have natural rights, even in a state of complete nature, but your rights are very insecure because in a, in a state of anarchy, it's just might makes right. Whoever's the strongest, whoever can impose their will by force on everybody else is who's going to rule. And so man's rights are insecure in the natural state. And so what John Locke's social compact said was that men compact together, they, they agree together to establish a government, and that men cede to that government, they give up to that government certain powers to secure their rights. All right, now you can't form a government without giving up some powers. But the idea is that the powers that government should have are the powers to protect people's rights, protect those natural rights. By the, by the, the way, the idea of natural rights, people try and make up all kinds of rights today. And often these new rights that people will claim, what they require is that somebody else provide you with something. That's not a natural right, right? If we were all out just in a state of nature, no government, no, no society, none of that, we were just in a state of nature, I would not have the right for anybody to have to provide me with food or shelter or health care or a job or any of those things, right? Now, I would have the right to protect my my person. I would have the right to protect my property. I would have the right to my life. I would have those kinds of natural rights, but no rights that require somebody else to provide something for me. Okay, that's what natural rights are. Today, when people claim these new rights, often what they're claiming is that somebody else has to provide something for them. That's outside of, of what these men would have understood to be rights. And so the job of the government was not to feed and clothe and house people. It was not to keep people healthy. It was not to uh, keep people from making unhealthy choices. The, the purpose of government was to secure your rights, not to, not to you know, make up all of these new rights. So, so those were the, the forces that shaped the thoughts of that day. And you can see many of these ideas echoed in the Declaration of Independence. And we're going to get to the Declaration itself. But we want to, just over the next few minutes, look at some of the history, the factors that led to independence, to the, the colonies declaring themselves free and independent states. The, the colonists understand, we're not, it's almost a misnomer to talk about the American Revolution. When you talk about a revolution, usually what you're describing is some group that wants to come in and change the government. So uh, many, many countries have had Marxist revolutions where they had some kind of a, a dictatorship or something like that, and some group comes in and they want to replace the government with a new form of government. That's not what was in the mind of the colonists. What they believed was that they had the ancient rights of Englishmen. They believed that even though they were colonists, that they ought to have all the rights that, that Englishmen had. They viewed themselves as Englishmen. And so they weren't claiming new rights. They weren't trying to have some new form of government. They were trying to get the British government to uphold the things that were recognized as the rights of Englishmen, things going back to, uh, for instance, the Magna Carta and, and other things within English legal history. The English had violated their colonial charters. Now understand that these colonies were crown colonies, right? They were colonies of the king. They were established by the king. They were not colonies of the parliament. And so parliament, English parliament, really had no authority over the colonies. They were under the king. But Parliament began to pass laws that affected the colonies, even though they weren't under the Parliament's jurisdiction. That's what a lot of the, the issue was with the taxes and different things that were laid on them, was that Parliament had no authority to pass laws for the colonies. In addition, the king was violating their charters. For instance, under their charters, these colonies had their own legislatures. 
that governed the internal affairs of the colonies. But especially as the relations began to sour between the colonies and the king, the, the colonial legislatures would pass laws and the king would nullify those laws. And this was in violation of their charters. And so their charters had been violated. Um, the issue of taxation without representation. Now, understand that at, at certain points, Britain offered them representation in Parliament. So when it talks about taxation without representation, the emphasis is not on the lack of representation. The emphasis is on the taxation part because they were offered representation and they didn't want it. They didn't want the representation and they didn't want the taxation either. Uh, but but uh, they believed, again, Parliament was passing taxes on them that Parliament did not have the authority to pass. By the way, if they had accepted representation, that would have made that parliamentary authority over them legitimate. That's what, they didn't want representation. They didn't want Parliament to have any authority over them whatsoever. And what was understood with these colonies was that there was a, a feudal relationship. Now feudalism, um, really feudalism is a, a, a system of government or, or a way of operating government that actually provides a great degree of liberty because you have different levels of government. Um, if you think about you know, when you had the, the king and the lords and, and then the serfs, the lords would seek often to protect the serfs that were under them. Uh, now often they also, they also violated the rights of those serfs, but often the lords were in opposition to the king. right? But the idea in a feudal relationship is that you, if you're a vassal, you have certain responsibilities to the Lord, but the Lord has certain responsibilities to you. Okay? Now, these colonies, as vassals of the king, the king's job was to provide defense for them, was to provide certain things for them, and the king had, especially as, again, as these relations soured, the king announced they were no longer going to provide any defense for the colonies. If the French wanted to attack them, if the Indians wanted to attack them, England was not going to provide any defense. And so that relationship, if, if the Lord in the vassal-lord relationship, if the Lord wasn't upholding his part of the contract, the vassals weren't under responsibility to uphold their part of the contract, right? If he's not going to, to provide the defense and different things that are his responsibility, then they felt they didn't have the responsibility to give him their allegiance. They made many petitions to the king. They petitioned him, they, they you know, asked for relief on many of these issues, and their petitions were rejected. And they describe in the Declaration some of these petitions and things, and how often the answer they would receive would not be for the king to provide relief for, for the issues they were concerned about, but just the fact that they would petition the king would result in stronger sanctions from the king against them. He would punish them even asking for any relief on these issues. And so their petitions were rejected. And so there came a point where the colonists called for a Continental Congress. And this was a meeting of delegates from the, the uh, colonies to decide what they were going to do. The first Continental Congress met from September 5th to October 26th in 1774. What the Congress decided to do was they, they uh, presented one more petitioned to the king, and they agreed that they would have a second Congress if the king did not respond favorably to their petition. Now, they knew that the king was not going to respond favorably. He hadn't responded favorably to any of their petitions up to that point. They knew he wasn't going to respond favorably, but they wanted to give the king one more opportunity to, to address these important issues, and that was the result of the First Continental Congress. As you know, and as they expected, the king did not respond favorably to the petition. They began the Second Continental Congress, May 10th, 1775. Again, delegates from the, from the colonies met together. This Continental Congress, I don't have an end date on there because really when it was the Second Continental Congress that declared independence, and this Second Continental Congress became the de facto legislature of the uh, uh, new union that was formed under the Articles of Confederation. And so you can't really put a, an end date on that Second Continental Congress. It just became the Congress of the United States. Okay? And 
May 15, 1776, the Virginia Convention instructs its delegates to propose independence. Now, um, Virginia was one of the most powerful states at the time. One of, they were one of the larger states. And they were very influential in the movement for independence. And you think about the men who came from Virginia, men like Washington and Madison and Jefferson and George Mason and, and you know, these people that were from the, uh, the colony of Virginia. And these delegates, you know, the delegates were always receiving instructions and sending information back to their states about what was going on in the Congress. And the Virginia Convention, they instructed their delegates, we want you to propose independence. And it was on June 7, 1776, that Richard Henry Lee introduces the resolution for independence. Now, Richard Henry Lee is a, a very important character in that Second Continental Congress. He would have been a, a, a relative of another Lee that, that came later, the uh, Confederate General Robert E. Lee. This would be a um, something like a, a, a great uncle or, or uh, you know, a, a distant relation of Robert E. Lee. Richard Henry Lee is the one who offers the, the resolution for independence. Now, the way these things work in a, a body like this is somebody makes the motion and then it's sent to a committee to work out the finer details. But uh, Richard Henry Lee, uh, here's his resolution. And if you're familiar with the Declaration of Independence, you'll see that much of the wording of his original resolution became part of the Declaration of Independence. The resolution was resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Now again, you, you notice that's very similar to the wording of the Declaration of Independence. The vote was postponed for three weeks, but they formed a committee to draft a Declaration of Independence. And this was a very controversial thing. I mean, by, by no means were all of the delegates in favor of independence at that time. And they postponed the vote, but they formed this committee to draft the Declaration. And it was a committee of five men. Thomas Jefferson is one of the men, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston. These were the five men that drafted the Declaration of Independence. Now, most of the work was done by Jeff Jefferson. Now, uh, at one point, it seemed like Adams was going to be pressed into writing the Declaration of Independence. But Adams deferred to Jefferson, and he said, reason first, you are a Virginian, and Virginian ought to be, appear at the head of this business. Reason second, I am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. You are very much otherwise. Reason third, you can write ten times better than I can. Now, uh, there's an interesting history between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, if, you've, if you've seen the, uh, the HBO special about John Adams, it, it did a pretty good job bringing out that relationship. Here at this time, they were very good friends. There came to be a, a point where they became bitter en enemies, especially around a very contentious election of 1800 that we'll talk about later when we talk about uh, some of the, the provisions of the Constitution. Um, and by the end of their lives, they became great friends again. And uh, it's a, an interesting fact of history that John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died on exactly the same day. It was July 4th, fifth, exactly 50 years after the Declaration of Independence. Uh, just, just an interesting fact of history. The story goes that um, when John Adams died, a, a messenger was sent to the House of Jefferson to inform him of Adams's death. And when Jefferson died, a messenger was sent to John Adams's house to inform him of the death, and the two messengers passed on the way. They literally died on exactly the same day, the 4th of July, uh, exactly 50 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And uh, just a, a very inter interesting history between those two men. The Declaration of Independence, now, uh, we'll just read some of the opening words without going into all of the text of the Declaration. But you'll see many of these ideas that we've just looked at from Montesquieu, Blackstone, and Locke in the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence says, When in the course of human events 
it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Say so there's the law of nature, the law of nature's God. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. Now understand, part of the reason for the Declaration of Independence is a, a diplomatic reason because they know that they're going to need support of other nations if they are going to survive as an independent, as an independent uh, confederation of nations. And so part of it is to give the reasons to show that they have just cause to separate from Great Britain so that they can get the respect of other nations in the world to support them. The Declaration says, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's that idea of natural rights. Not that rights are granted by the government, but that rights come from God, from their Creator. And if rights come from God, then no government has the legitimate authority to violate those rights. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. There's John Locke's social compact. Right? Governments are instituted, why? To, to rule man and to oppress man? No, to secure man's rights. John Locke's social compact. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. You see, it's, it's not up to the government to decide what's best for the people, but rather the people establish a government that is most likely to affect their safety and happiness. And then it goes on to give all these various reasons why the king had violated his responsibility to these colonies. It says he has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. There's that, that uh, nullification of the laws passed in their legislatures. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be attained. And when so suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. You see, if the, if the king saw that, uh, that a legislative body in one of the colonies was going to do something against what he wanted, he would just dissolve them. By the way, the crown still has that power. Um, a couple of years ago in Canada, uh, the Canadian legislature was about to oust the, the uh, sitting president and the Queen dissolved the Canadian legislature. Most people don't realize that the Crown has that, that power over nations such as Canada, even to this day. Um, now, if the, you know, if the President were going to dissolve the legislature here in the United States, I think people would be in an uproar. I mean, as much as they don't like Congress, they wouldn't want to see one person having that power to be able to do that. But the Queen has that power over, over Canada. Uh, and that's what the king was doing here. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. By the way, the role of a king was considered to be the executive role, right? The legislature has the job of making the laws. The, the king, uh, even, in a, even in a monarchy, a limited monarchy like Great Britain, the king's power would be an executive role. But you see what the king was doing was he was infringing on that right of the legislatures and instead he was making himself the legislature and he was making himself the judiciary. Right? He, was, he was exercising control over the judiciary. He's made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. 
Um, by the way, if you, when you read the Constitution, you read many of the limitations on government, you find that many of the specific limitations in the Constitution were put there to address these specific abuses of the king. And so the king had done these things. The Constitution says, no, you can't do those things. All right. And um, it says that he's erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. One thing you may notice about many of these complaints is that these are the same complaints that people would have about our government today. It's an interesting thing that uh, many of the things our government today is doing in violation of the Constitution are exactly the same things that the people complained about the King of England and that caused them to declare independence. I mean, who, who could say that our federal government today has not erected a multitude of new offices. That who could say that they have not sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance? You know, and and, it, and it, of course it's happening not just on the federal level but on the state level. Uh, just just yesterday I was reading a story about a farm that was shut down because they weren't in in compliance with all of the regulations about selling milk. You know, and here, here in Wisconsin, America's dairy land, it's illegal for a farmer to sell milk to people. And uh, again, harassing the people and eating out their substance. Uh, he's kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He's affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. And we could go on and on through all of these different complaints that they had against the king. And again, see many, many echoes of these things in our government today. The difference is that we have a way to change our government today. They didn't have that. You see, they didn't have any way to change who the king was or, or change who the parliament was. We have a way to, to change those things. And this was the purpose later, after, after the declaration, later of the Constitution, was to avoid many of these specific things. Now that's where we're going to take a break and um, when we come back, then we'll look at the history between the Declaration of Independence leading up to the Constitutional Convention. In this session, we're going to look at now the history from the Declaration of Independence to the Constitutional Convention. And uh, so, so just a moment ago, we looked at the Declaration itself and, um, of course, the, the Declaration was that resolution for independence was passed by the Continental Congress, the Second Continental Congress, and the Declaration was signed. And it was obvious that th what the Declaration, the Declaration, by the way, did not, uh, it did not establish the United States as a new nation. What it declared was that each colony was its own nation. But the colonies understood that they, they were going to stand or fall together. Uh, they, they couldn't just operate completely as independent nations. And so on June 7th, 1776, now this is before even the, the declaration is signed, but just a few days, actually it's the same day as the resolution for the Declaration of Independence. Again, it's Richard Henry Lee that moves that a plan of confederation be prepared. Now a confederation is a, uh, you, you could almost view it as kind of like, a, like an organization or, or an assembly of these independent states. It's not a new nation, but it's a bunch of states confederated together. And so again, it's Richard Henry Lee that makes that motion that a plan of confederation be prepared. And on June 12, 1776, a committee is appointed to draft the Articles of Confederation. The drafting committee uh, consists of one of John Dickinson. Now, John Dickinson was the chairman of the committee. He was one of the wealthiest men in the colonies, a very well-respected man. He actually was not in favor of independence. He, he thought there was still room for reconciliation with Great Britain, and he actually refused to vote for independence, and he did not sign the Declaration of Independence. Now, the Continental Congress had passed a rule that anyone who did not sign the Declaration of Independence could not serve in the Continental Congress because they wanted to be certain 
they were all going to be together in this thing. And so he left the Continental Congress and he joined the Pennsylvania militia. Now, again, he did take part in the fight against Great Britain as a part of the militia, uh, but he was against independence at that time. He, as he, uh, when he refused to vote for independence, he says, my conduct this day, I expect, will give the finishing blow to my once too great and my integrity considered now too diminished popularity. And he was correct in that statement. Uh, also on the drafting committee was Samuel Adams. Now Samuel Adams was a cousin of John Adams. Uh, Samuel Adams was a failed businessman. He, um, he did work in the family business as a maltster. The, the, uh, his family, they were not brewers, they didn't brew beer, but they, they uh, provided malt to the brewers. And Samuel Adams, he, again, he completely failed in business. His father loaned him at one point a, a sum of money for him to start a business. Half of that he loaned to a friend of his who never paid him back, and the other half he just kind of, kind of frittered away. Um, he, uh, it was said of Samuel Adams that he was a man who cared nothing about making or keeping money. Uh, you know, personal, personal success in business was just not an important thing to him. But he wound up serving most of his life in public service. He served as a tax collector, but he very often would let people off on their taxes if he saw that they, they couldn't pay or they were in need or, or whatever. Now in that day, the way it worked was that if a tax collector didn't collect the taxes from somebody, he was personally liable for, for that tax bill. And uh, there were, in his, in his earlier life, there were several court cases against him trying to recover these taxes from him that he had not collected from other people. Later in his political life, his political opponents tried to use his court troubles against him, which really backfired on them because people liked the idea of a tax collector who didn't collect their taxes, right? And uh, so he was a very popular tax collector. He was one of the leaders of the Boston Tea Party. And later, Samuel Adams would be an anti-federalist. He was an opponent of the Constitution later on because he felt it gave too much power to the federal government. But uh, here he's on the drafting committee of the Articles of Confederation. He, in his lifetime, Samuel Adams served in almost every important, important uh, public office in the, the uh, state of Massachusetts. He was a member of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. He was a delegate to the Continental Congress, president of the Massachusetts Senate. So he served in both the House of Representatives and the, and the Senate there in Massachusetts. He was the Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts and the Governor of Massachusetts. So, so he served in both houses of the legislature, served in the, the Chief Executive position and in the Lieutenant Governor position. The Articles of Confederation is really the, our, our first constitution. Okay? It, it set up a federal government, the government of the Confederation, and uh, it, it gave very limited powers to that federal government. The, the committee was appointed on June 12, 1776. The draft was completed in November 1777, when it was proposed to the states for ratification. And on March 1st, 1781, the Articles of Confederation were finally ratified. So 1781 is when the Articles of Confederation come into effect to govern the, the states. A confederation from Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary is a league, a compact for mutual support, alliance, particularly of princes, nations, or states. And understand that these colonies viewed themselves as indep independent nations that entered into this confederation for mutual support. It was like an alliance, like a, a, a treaty organization or, or something like that. There are several things, uh, important things, that were put into place in the Articles of Confederation. It united the states in a perpetual union. Now, this would be a, a contentious issue later on when the Articles of Confederation were replaced with the Constitution because the Confederation said this was to be a perpetual union. 
uh, it, was, uh, the, it was the Articles of Confederation that established the name of the Union as the United States of America. That is the, the official name of the Union that's put in place before the Constitution. It's put in place in the Articles of Confederation. Under the Articles, every state retained its sovereignty and every power that was not expressly delegated to the United States. And there were very few powers that were delegated to the, the United States, the, the government of the Confederation. One of the main reasons that it was instituted was to provide for the common defense of the states. That was the main function of the, the federal government was to provide for the common defense of these independent states. It established freedom of movement between the states. So even though they were independent nations, the, the people of one state could move to another state. They could cross the borders freely. In some cases, there were taxes or other things that were required when you brought property across a border. But there was freedom of movement between these states. And in the, in the Congress of the Confederation, each state had one vote. Okay, so there weren't two houses of the legislature or anything like that. There was only one house. Each state had one vote, whether they were a large state or a small state. Rhode Island had the same say in this Congress as what Virginia had or New York had. And delegates to the central government the power to conduct foreign relations and declare war. They realized that with external matters, matters involving foreign governments, declarations of war, this kind of thing, they needed to speak with one voice. And so the federal government would have the power to do those things. One state could not declare war. One state could not enter into, into private treaties with other nations. These were things that would be done by that central government. Under the Articles of Confederation, taxes were apportioned to the state legislatures based on the property values of the state. So the way this would work is the Confederation would decide how much money they needed in a certain tax levy and then they would take the entire property value of all of the states and they would look at the property value of say Virginia and, and say what's their total property value, what proportion is that of the total and then whatever that, that ratio was they would apply that to whatever the, the taxing amount was, the, the amount they needed to raise in taxes and the state of Virginia would be liable for that much of the tax. Now Virginia could collect the tax however they wanted. If they wanted to do it through, through property tax, if they wanted to do it through a head tax, it, however they wanted to collect that, they could do it, but the state had to come up with that amount of tax. And it was according to the property value, not the population, not anything else, but the property value of that state. It declares that the Articles of Confederation are perpetual, again, with, without end, and can only be altered by the approval of Congress with ratification by all the state legislatures. Now, you know under the current Constitution, amendments have to be ratified by three-fourths of the states. This required all the state legislatures to ratify any changes to the Articles. And what that did was it made any changes to the Articles of Confederation basically impossible. Uh, there were very few issues on which all of these states would agree and often even if all the other states agreed on something it was Rhode Island that would disagree. Rhode Island remember was, was uh, populated with largely with people that got kicked out of the other colonies. Um, the uh, uh, Roger Williams was a, a Baptist preacher and the Baptists were not very well accepted. Most of the colonies were predominantly uh, Church of England or um, other denominations, Congregationalists, and the Baptists, they didn't like the Baptists and Roger Williams got, got kicked out. He went there to Rhode Island and many of the people there in Rhode Island were the nonconformists. They were the, the people who didn't fit in anywhere else. And so they were very unlikely to go along with anything that the other states wanted to do. And so uh, often it would be Rhode Island with their one vote, the smallest state with their one vote could hold up pretty much anything under the Articles of Confederation. The, the Articles provided a central government to govern the states but not the people directly. Under the Articles of Confederation that, that federal government could not pass any law that, that would be directly on people. They could pass laws that governed how the states 
dealt with things. They could not pass laws that, that uh, directly governed the people because it was a government of the, of the uh, states. Now, if you want to know, you know, do some more research on what were the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation, the Federalist Papers go into great detail. Remember, the Federalist Papers were written by uh, James Madison, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton to promote the Constitution. And as time went by, they saw there were weaknesses in the Articles of Confederation that needed to be addressed. And the Federalist Papers go into great detail in what those weaknesses were. Now, you, all, you have to understand that the authors of the Federalist Papers are trying to get people to support replacing the Articles of Confederation. So understand they may have exaggerated some of the problems at times, but that's probably the greatest in detail uh, criticism of the Articles of Confederation. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, the Federalist Papers said about the Articles, it says, we may indeed with propriety be said to have reached almost the last stage of national humiliation. Now this is after several years under the Articles. To shorten an enumeration of particulars, which can afford neither pleasure nor instruction, it may in general be demanded, what indication is there of national disorder, poverty, and insignificance, that could befall a community so peculiarly blessed with natural advantages as we are, which does not form a part of the dark catalog of our public misfortunes. In Federalist number 21, it lists as one of the weaknesses of the articles that the United States had no power to enforce its own laws. The United States have no powers to exact obedience or punish disobedience to their resolutions. The United States afford the extraordinary spectacle of a government destitute even of the shadow of constitutional power to enforce the execution of its own laws. The American Conf Confederacy in this particular stands discriminated from every other institution of a similar kind and exhibits a new and unexampled phenomenon in the political world. They had a Congress, they had a, a, you know, a body to pass laws, but they had no executive branch. There was no executive branch to execute the laws. The states were kind of on their honor to follow the laws that were passed. The, um, one of the, the things that was seen as a weakness was that Congress had no power to regulate commerce under the Articles. It says, no nation acquainted with the nature of our political association would be unwise enough to enter into stipulations with the United States by which they conceded privileges of any importance to them while they were apprised that the engagements on the part of the Union might at any moment be violated by its members and while they found from experience that they might enjoy every advantage they desired in our markets without granting us any return. Even if they had passed some, some treaty regarding commerce with foreign nations, there was no way to enforce it and there was no way to get the states to, to enforce it so that if they, if they, for instance, set a tariff or something like that, um, all the foreign government would have to do or a foreign business would have to do would be to find some state that won't enforce the tariff, bring their products in there, and then from there they're free to move all throughout the rest of the uh, confederation. The, um, the way that armies were raised under the Articles was that they were raised by quotas much the same way the taxes were apportioned. If they wanted to raise a certain number of men for an army, they would send out a quota and they would say, Virginia, here's how many men you need to raise. Massachusetts, here's how many men you need to raise. Okay, and, and so on through the states. What that did was it made a competition between the states to raise these men. And what people would do is they would shop around to see what state they could get the best deal in and go there and sign up where they could get the best salary or the shortest terms or whatever. And so Federalist number 22 says, Hence slow and scanty levies of men in the most critical emergencies of our affairs, short enlistments at an unparalleled expense, because again, these states would have to compete, right? So they would offer to pay them more and give them shorter enlist enlistments, continual fluctuations in the troops, ruinous to their discipline and subjecting the public safety frequently to the perilous crisis of a disbanded army. Because, you know, they'd give them these short enlistments and the army would disband and that's, that was always seen as a, a kind of a, a bad thing if you're near a, an army encampment or something and the army disbands and all these men come into your town, there's a lot of negative things associated with that. 
And uh, so this was inefficient and harmful to the states. The idea that each state, no matter how large, would have an equal vote in Congress, it gave an inordinate power to the smaller states like Rhode Island or New Jersey or, or these other states. Um, Federalist number 22 expressed that this really violated the principle of Republican government that the sense of the majority should prevail. And it specifies, it says, it may happen that the majority of states is a small minority of the people of America. We can enumerate nine states which contain less than a majority of the people. Now, out of 13 states, that means that you could have nine states that, that uh, if you counted up their population, would still be less than a majority, but they would have a huge majority in the Congress of the Confederation. And so it gave this, this inordinate power to the small states. There was no provision for a Supreme Court. So they had no way to enforce their laws and they had no real court of last resort to go to to apply the laws. Um, presumably the, the state courts had to provide any kind of, of judicial power. So there was no central judicial power to to uh, settle disputes between the states and, and those kinds of things. And there were many other weaknesses that were listed. Those were just some of the, the major points. But from September 11th to the 14th of 1786, there were 12 delegates from five states, and these were five large states, that met at Annapolis to discuss changes to the Articles of Confederation. And what they did was they moved for a larger convention of all the states to be held in Philadelphia the following May. Remember, any changes have to be approved by all of the states. So these five states meeting together, I mean, they might be able to propose some changes, but there's not a lot of force behind that. So they decide, after discussing the issue, that there should be a larger convention of all the states in Philadelphia. And that Philadelphia Convention is what we refer to as the Constitutional Convention, and that was to begin the following May. The, uh, the Constitutional Convention, understand, was not called to write a new constitution. They were called to propose changes to the Articles of Confederation. That was the express purpose of the convention, was to propose changes that then would be sent out to the states for ratification. But as they began to discuss the issue, the delegates decided they were going to write a new constitution altogether. Uh, there's very little in our current constitution that, that comes from the Articles of Confederation. This convention met from May 25th to September 17th, 1787. So throughout the summer of 1787, they met there in Philadelphia. George Washington was elected to preside over the convention, and that's a very important thing. It was a very important thing to the acceptance of the Constitution by the people in the nation. George Washington was such an influential figure. I mean, this, I mean he was known as the, the father of our country. Um, even, I'm not sure if that, if that name was applied in his own day while he was still alive, but certainly he was viewed in that light even in his own day. This was the man who had led our forces to victory against the greatest military power in the world, right? And, and so George Washington was just a, a figure of giant stature. And really, probably the convention would not have even taken place had not Washington agreed to be involved. And it would have been much harder to ratify the Constitution if Washington had not been a, a supporter of it. And so Washington was elected to preside over the convention. He, he was like the chairman, the president of this convention. It included 55 delegates from 12 states. And remember, there were 13 states, so you can guess which state it was. It didn't send any delegates. It was that pesky Rhode Island. Um, they, Rhode Island didn't want any changes in the Articles of Confederation. They loved it. They had everything to gain under the Articles. And, and nothing to lose. I mean, they, little Rhode Island had the same vote as Virginia or New York. So why would they want any change to that, right? And so, so they refused to even participate. They didn't send any, any delegates to uh, the uh, Constitutional Convention. 
some of the prominent delegates, and these are some of the ones, you know, you, of course you know about, about Franklin and, and uh, Madison and them, but Roger Sherman, a very, very important founding father. He was a delegate from Connecticut. He was the first mayor of New Haven, Connecticut. He was a, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, the Articles of Confederation, and the Constitution. In fact, I believe he may be the only man that was a signer of all of those. Uh, if he wasn't the only one, he's one of a, a very small few that signed all of those documents. It was said of, of Roger Sherman, Thomas Jefferson said of him, that is Mr. Sherman of Connecticut, a man who never said a foolish thing in his life. And that's high praise from a man like Thomas Jefferson. Uh, another important delegate was Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts. He was the vice president under James Madison, delegate to the Continental Congress, and he was a leading champion of the Federalists. By the way, it's also from his name that we get the term gerrymandering. Uh, gerrymandering refers to, after a census, you know, changing the districts to be politically favorable to your party. Uh, Elbridge Gerry um, was involved in some of that and there was a, a uh, newspaper who showed there was this one district that they had redistricted that went all the way from the, the northern part of the state and then it like came down over, over the uh, western part of the state and then down into the south, you know, and uh, there was a newspaper that published a cartoon that showed this district as being like a, like a dragon or, or uh, somebody said it looked like a salamander and the newspaper editor said call it a gerrymander and that's where the term comes from. Uh, Benjamin Franklin of course from Pennsylvania he was known for his many inventions, theories and, and discoveries. Uh, he formed the first public library in America and Franklin really kind of embodies the American spirit. Uh, now there's, you know, you study the history of Franklin, there were a lot of, a lot of bad things about Franklin too, but his, that spirit of invention and entrepreneurship and, and those things, he was kind of the aged statesman at the convention. And very often it was, uh, at times of great controversy, it was Franklin who would know just the right words to say to kind of settle everybody down, get them back, focused on what they, what they needed to do. And so Franklin as a, as a character really is considered to be sort of foundational of American values and, and character. George Mason, a very important person from Virginia, very important delegate. He's called the father of the Bill of Rights. George Mason was an anti-federalist, which means after the Constitution was completed, he went home and tried to convince people not to ratify the Constitution. He, he was against it. He felt he gave too much power to the federal government. And uh, the reason he's called the father of the Bill of Rights was he finally insisted that if it was going to be ratified, there needed to be a Bill of Rights attached to it that would specifically lay out some of the rights that were protected that the federal government could not violate. And uh, after the, the addition of the Bill of Rights, or, or you know, with that addition, he became a supporter of the Constitution. Um, he was one of the most frequent speakers at the convention, but he did not sign the Constitution. He didn't sign it. He, again, felt it gave too much power to the, uh, to the federal government. Some important controversies that came up at the Constitutional Convention. Probably the most controversial thing, and, and it was the most important issue, really, that needed to be worked out, was what the plan of the government would be. Now, remember, originally they were just supposed to propose changes to the articles, but they really decided that the articles were so flawed that they needed a, a new government. Madison came prepared. He had gone and studied all kinds of historical governments uh, throughout the world. He came prepared with those resources. Um, you know, people, people uh, came looking at what, what kind of government do we want to have? Do we want to have something that resembles a monarchy? Do we want to have a, a democracy? Do we want to have a republic? What do we want to have? And, and how will the power be divided up? Now, you may not be able to see these charts very well, but the Virginia plan, the Virginia plan was also known as the large state plan. And what the Virginia plan included, this, this was largely put together by James Madison. He looked, again, at all of these different 
nations of the world. If you read the Federalist Papers, Madison in his writings will, will refer again and again to different governments and confederations and leagues that took place in the ancient world and what their problems were and what their benefits were. And he tried to take the best from all of these and put it together into one plan. In, in the Virginia plan, there was a, what's called a bicameral legislature, which means you have two houses of the legislature. Not one, like under the Articles of Confederation, but you have two houses. And there would be an upper house and a lower house. This would be similar to what you have in, in Britain. You have a House of Lords and a House of Commons. In Virginia, you had the, uh, uh, the House of Burgesses and, and another, I, I forget what the other uh, house of the legislature was. But um, in Madison's plan, the lower house would be elected by the people. So you would have one, one house of the legislature elected directly by the people. The upper house in Madison's plan would be elected by the lower house. So you have this idea of, of different levels of representation. So Madison's plan, the people elect the lower house, the lower house elects the upper house. The executive under, under uh, the Virginia plan would have been elected by the legislature. Legislature elects the executive. Um, he had a judicial branch, and you can see here the legislature would establish the inferior courts. In his plan, the um, there would be this council of revision and and you know, kind of this intermediary government again. And under the Virginia plan, the executive and some of the judiciary would have the power to veto, veto laws passed by the legislature, but it would be subject to an override. So that the legislature, if enough of them agreed, they could override these vetoes. Uh, this was called the large state plan. And it favored the large states because your legislature all come either directly or indirectly from the people. So the states with the larger number of people would have greater representation, right? The New Jersey plan is referred to as the small state plan. Uh, the New Jersey plan was really more in line with what the purpose of the convention was, what it was originally called for, which was to propose changes to the articles. Remember the small states, and the New Jersey plan was called the small state plan. The small states liked the articles. It gave them a lot of power. So the New Jersey plan kept the current Congress um, just like it was, one vote per, per state, it had a multi-person executive branch that was elected by Congress. The, under the New Jersey plan, the executives would serve a single term and they were subject to recall by the state governors. So again, it gives a lot of power to, to the state, to the state government over the federal government. It created a judiciary. Everybody realized they needed a judiciary. And the judiciary would serve life terms, and they would be appointed by the executive. And um, under the New Jersey plan, laws passed by Congress would take precedence over state laws. Okay, So while on the one hand it gives great power to the state governments, it also gives some, some power to Congress to override state law. Now, there was another plan. Those were the two main ones that were debated. There was another plan that was presented, but it was never seriously debated. And this was a plan presented by Alexander Hamilton. Now, remember, when you talk about Hamilton, and Hamilton was a great fan of central government, strong central government. And when you, when you think about the person of Alexander Hamilton, understand this was the kind of government that Hamilton thought we ought to have. Under Hamilton's plan, there would be a complete consolidation of the states. The states would no longer be independent, sovereign states. They would basically just be, be uh, branches of the federal government. So Hamilton's plan was to do away, really, with independent states and instead have one national government. Uh, under Hamilton's plan, there were two houses of the legislature. The lower house would be elected by the people for three-year terms. The upper house would be elected by electors chosen by the people, and the upper house would serve for life. So if you think about that in, in uh, relation to our Senate, uh, our senators ser currently serve six-year terms. Under Hamilton's plan, senators would serve life, lifetime terms. 
Um, the, the executive in Hamilton's plan was called a governor, not a president, but a governor. And he would be elected by electors for lifetime service. He'd be elected to a lifetime term, and he would have an absolute veto over anything the legislature passed. So essentially, under Hamilton's plan, you would have an elected monarchy. You would have a governor who was elected for life that could, there was no possibility for the legislature to override his veto. He could veto any law that they passed, okay? Um, under uh, Hamilton's plan, the state governors would, uh, would be appointed by the national legislature. So instead of you electing the governor of Wisconsin, the legislature would appoint somebody just like, again, just like a monarchy would appoint a governor over a colony or something like that. And under Hamilton's plan, the national legislature had veto power over any state legislation since the states under Hamilton's plan would just be like a, a, a level of the federal government. If the natural, national legislature didn't like some law in Wisconsin, they could just veto it. So you see what Hamilton's plan was. And again, Hamilton is the fan of, of very strong central government. Remember, it's Hamilton that gave us our first national bank, central bank. Um, those are the kinds of things that Hamilton supported. Now, again, this was never seriously debated because it was so far outside of the realm of what was acceptable to most of the delegates that they, they didn't even really give it a great amount of consideration, and we can be thankful for that. Uh, they eventually came to a compromise. The, the main debate was between the large state plan and the small state plan. The small states didn't want to give up the power that they had under the Articles. The large states wanted to have more power than what they had under the Articles. And so the, what they eventually came up with, the plan they eventually proposed, blended the Virginia and the New Jersey plans. It, it took elements from both. What it did was it, it used that bicameral legislature. And in the House, in the House of Representatives, which is the lower house of the legislature, they would be elected directly by the people. People would elect them directly. In the Senate, originally under the Constitution, senators were elected by the state legislatures. The idea was that the House of Representatives would represent the people directly. The Senate would represent the states. And so in the Senate, every state has equal representation. There's two senators per state, whether it's a big state or a small state. In the House, Larger states have more representatives, smaller states have less. And so it, it did a blending of these two. And originally, the, under this com Connecticut Compromise, it was called, each state would have one vote in the Senate. Uh, later that was changed um, so that in the final Constitution it was two votes in the Senate. Okay. Uh, another contentious issue at the convention was the issue of slavery. Outside of the plan of government, this was probably uh, the most contentious issue. You had a, a great regional divide between the North and the South already by that time. Uh, in the entire United States, slaves were about 20% of the total population. So one out of five people living in the United States was a slave. And so you can see why it would be a contentious issue. In the South, slaves were 40% of the population. So four out of 10, two, two out of five um, in the South were slaves. And the Southern states, if, if slavery, if they had discontinued slavery in the Constitution, the Southern states would have refused to join. And these people realized that they couldn't have two groups of states. They couldn't have uh, you know, w one group of states in the north and then all the states in the south separate because the danger that that provided was if Britain wanted to come in, all they'd have to do is defeat one of those smaller states that was on their own and then they would have troops on the, on the mainland, right? And, and so they realized they had to stay together and so there were a lot of compromises made on this issue of slavery. Uh, so so the, one of the agreements that they came to uh, had to do with the slave trade um, but before we get, get to that, let's talk here about representation and taxation. Um, when it came to representation, so in the House of Representatives, your representatives are going to be determined by your population. Well, do you count slaves as part of the population or don't you count slaves as part of the population? 
in the North, they said, no, you shouldn't count the slaves because it's really their masters that are being represented. The slaves, the slaves aren't going to have the right to vote or anything like that. So they said, no, you shouldn't count the slaves. In the South, of course, they said, well, you have to count the slaves, right? 40% of their population are slaves. So they don't want to lose 40% of their representation. And so the South says, yes, count them for representation. The North says, no, don't count them. But then on the position of taxation, of course, th they were exactly opposite. They took the opposite positions. In the North, they said, of course, you've got to count them for taxation, right? The South should have to pay taxes, not just by their free population, but all of their population. I mean, we wouldn't want, to want the South to get off with paying 40% less taxes, right? So they said, yeah, they should count for, for taxation. The South said, no, they shouldn't count for taxation, right? And so each side both wanted, they wanted everything their way. The compromise that they came to is found in Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution. It says, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within this union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all other persons. Now you notice it doesn't mention slaves specifically, but it talks about uh, uh, the free persons, and then it says three-fifths of all other persons, and that's where the slaves would have fit. Some people misrepresent what this says. Some people say that they believed that blacks were only three-fifths of a person. And that's not the issue at all. For instance, there were many free blacks, right, freed slaves in the United States. They were not counted as three-fifths of a person. They were, they, were counted, they were counted the same as any other free person. The issue was not black or white. The issue was slave or free. And it doesn't say that anybody is three-fifths of a person. You see, it says that how it's going to be apportioned and how you're going to count for apportionment is that you're going to count three-fifths of all other persons. They're a whole person, but you count three-fifths. Now, the people who criticize this and, and say, you know, it's racist because it counts them as three-fifths of a person, it doesn't do that, but what would be the alternative? If the slaves had been counted the same as, as whites, what it would have done is it would have given more representation to the South than what it did. It probably would have extended slavery longer, okay? So, so this actually took power away from the slave states by counting them three-fifths, all right? And uh, so this was, the, this was the compromise they came to. So they're counted as three-fifths for both representation and taxation. So the South doesn't get the full benefit of those slaves for representation, but they also don't get the, uh, the full detriment of having to pay taxes based on that population. This was, the, this was the compromise that they came to. Another contentious issue regarding slavery was the slave trade. Now understand these are two separate issues. By the time of the Constitution, 10 states out of 13 had already outlawed the slave trade, which means you, know, you could not bring slaves from Africa or from the Caribbean into those states. Okay? They had outlawed the slave trade. Most of them still allowed domestic sale of slaves, but you couldn't bring in any more of these slaves. So 10 out of the 13 had already outlawed it. Uh, the slave trade still continued in Georgia and North and South Carolina. And what their compromise was that they would uh, postpone any action regarding the slave trade for 20 years. So any outlaw of the slave trade could not take place until at least 20 years after the ratification of the Constitution. The, uh, again, this, these concessions, they were willing to make these concessions because they knew all of these states had to stick together. They couldn't, they couldn't allow even one state to remain out of the Union. And so if a state like Georgia or North Carolina was going to stay out over this issue of the slave trade, then they had to, they had to give con some concessions there in order to keep this Union together. 
at a particularly contentious moment in the, in the uh, Constitutional Convention. It was Benjamin Franklin who stood and made a motion that they have daily prayer during the Constitutional Convention. Now during the, uh, for instance, the First Continental Congress, they had daily prayer. They opened every day with prayer. Uh, during the Revolution, the Congress opened every day with prayer. And Ben Franklin, this, you know, if you know Ben Franklin's religious views, this was probably more of a, a political move than anything else. It was, again, one of those times where Franklin would try and say just the right words to kind of calm things down and, and get people back in the proper focus. And Brent, Ben Franklin makes this motion that they have daily prayer. He says, how has it happened, sir, that we have not hitherto once thought of humbly applying to the Father of lights to illuminate our understanding. In the beginning of the contest with Great Britain, we had daily prayer in this room for our divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard and they were graciously answered. And have we now forgotten that powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We have been assured, sir, in the sacred, sacred writings, that except the Lord build the house, they that labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We shall be divided by our little partial local interests, our projects will be confounded, and we ourselves shall become a reproach and byword down to future ages. And what is worse, mankind may hereafter from this unfortunate instance despair of establishing governments by human wisdom and leave it to chance, war, and conquest. Now that gives you an, an example of the, the types of political speeches and things that were given in that day. Here in just that short speech, Ben Franklin, who was not a, even a particularly religious man, you wouldn't consider Ben Franklin to be a Christian, he makes reference to the Bible at least three times just in that short, short space there. But um, he, his motion, by the way, failed. Uh, they did not begin to have daily prayer there. Uh, one delegate stood up and said they didn't have any funds to, to bring in anybody to, to offer prayer. Um, there were some other objections to it. And actually, I shouldn't say his motion failed because they never voted on it. They just, they just postponed it. Uh, this was just before they were going to take, take a, a break in their session of, of several weeks. And so they tabled the motion. It never came up again. But Franklin's words had the, the effect anyway, which was that it, it brought all of these rival interests back together in the, the, the focus um, on which they were gathered for. And it was after this point that, you know, there was still controversy, but after this point, a lot of that controversy um, kind, of, kind of, people were a little more willing to, to make some concessions to others and, and that kind of thing. And that just gives an example of the, the way that Benjamin Franklin, he didn't say a whole lot, but when he did, it was usually to, to kind of get people to slow down, take a little heat out of the issue, and get them to think about what they were doing. And uh, that was on June 28th, 1787, that, that Benjamin Franklin made that motion and, and made that speech. And uh, as you know, the, the Constitutional Convention wrote the Constitution in the, in the years since. We've amended it. We've amended it um, nearly 30 times. We've amended that Constitution. But the fact that in over 200 years, we've only amended it that handful of times, and when you consider that Ten of those were the Bill of Rights that came very soon after ratification. It shows you how great a document they put together. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States uh, can rightfully be considered the greatest founding documents of, of any nation put together by man in the history of the world. Uh, you can search out the history of the world and you will not find this kind of wisdom in these founding documents. The Declaration of Independence lays out the principles, right? It lays out the principles that man is endowed by his creator with unalienable rights. It lays out the principle that governments are there to secure 
man's rights. And the Constitution says, here's our best effort to put together a government of, of depraved men Understand they had no better view of politicians in their day than what we have of, of them today. The Founding fathers themselves wrote about how if there weren't limitations on them, they would turn into wolves and they would, they would uh, destroy the nation and, and become tyrants themselves. They, they didn't even put faith in themselves to limit themselves. They, they saw that a, a limitation of government was necessary to limit that, that depraved nature they had, that nature that any man would have to take power to himself and to protect the rights of the people. And so in the future lessons, we'll go into the, the, uh, the text of the Constitution itself and see what is that plan of government that they put into place? What are the limited powers of our federal government? And we'll look at the many instances where they've violated that contract, they've violated that social compact by which they are to, to secure our rights. And um, they've done it in the past and they're doing it currently as well. And uh, we'll also look at how to, how to get back to constitutional government, what it'll, what it'll require from us, from, from the people, to get us back to where we ought to be and get our government back in line and obeying the contract between them and we the people.